You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. We are continuing our conversations in the Set Apart to Serve series. Today, we head to the seminary to meet with a fourth-year seminary student learning about seminary life and that formation of becoming a pastor. Our guest today, Drew Oswald, his fourth-year student at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Drew, welcome to The Coffee Hour. Thank you. I appreciate you guys having me on. Well, thanks for coming on to share your story about becoming a student at Concordia Seminary and that path to becoming a church worker. Let's start with that. When did you first start thinking about going to seminary and serving potentially as a pastor in the future? Yeah, that's a question I get all the time. And I used to hate that question a lot until actually this fall, because I don't have this sort of like the skies cracked open or I was knocked off some sort of animal type story. My story is really, really normal. I guess if I had to like pinpoint it somewhere, I would blame my mother. I think it was like when I was like seven or eight years old or something, we walked out of a church service and she said like, oh, I could see you being a pastor. So then my, you know, things progressed from there and conversations with a high school theology teacher took a visit down to the seminary here in St. Louis when I was a junior in high school. That went really, really great. And then I majored in secondary education and decided to become a Lutheran school teacher and then came down to the seminary after that. So sort of a lot of normal stuff, lots of normal conversations, just people that God placed in my life to sort of push me this direction and also the desire to, to serve God's people in a variety of ways also. What was that so preparation like being a teacher first? Was there additional preparation that you had to go through in order to be ready to to enter the seminary for the MDiv program? Yeah, so I started at Concordia Seward after high school. My plan was to be just Lutheran teacher. I had teachers in my family. My mom is a teacher at a public school. I have an older brother who went to Concordia Seward in the education program. And I, so I really wanted to be a teacher. And then like my sophomore year, I kind of decided that I probably someday would go to seminary, kind of who knows when that might be kind of thing. So I actually took Greek when I was an undergrad, but I didn't have Hebrew. And since I was doing a Lutheran teacher's diploma at Seward, I had a lot of like the doctrinal background and those sort of things. So to come to the seminary, I I knew I would have to take Hebrew. I passed my Greek qualifier because my my Greek professor, King Corday Seward, was like the best teacher ever. So I passed Greek after five years off. But extra stuff, I actually, this is, I guess, kind of a funny story. So when I was a, a teacher in Omaha, Nebraska, I was like our, our speech coach and I, you know, lesson plans and got up and talked in front of kids all that time. I did have to take an online speech course to to get admitted to the seminary despite all of this experience. Although that that has been waived since I complained a lot after that. <laughs> So there, there was some extra kind of stuff, but nothing nothing for me just because I had gone to Concordia and had done some language kind of things before. Wow. That's quite like the preparation. How do you see now as a student at Concordia Seminary, your experience as an educator, as a teacher, you see that being significant in your experience now and your formation as a, a seminarian? It's been a huge, huge benefit on a number of different levels. One, I'm a better student because I know sort of what teachers want and I know how to do school, as it were. But also, too, I, since I taught theology, I taught a ton of different things since I was at a Lutheran school. But I, since I taught theology specifically, I got such a great opportunity to to do some like counseling kind of things with with different kids. So I got to hear tons of life stories and I got to answer a ton of questions. The school where I taught in Omaha was is a Lutheran school. We had a lot of Lutheran kids, but also there are a lot of sort of non-denominational, evangelical, Pentecostal type of students who wanted a really good Christian education. And so they would come to our school, which was which was great. Those kids were awesome kids. And they asked a ton of really, really good questions. So coming into the seminary with that experience, having heard a bunch of the questions that my students have, having heard about their life experience and life story, I could hear things in class that maybe even some of my classmates would would ask questions like, you know, why are we learning this? Or why have we, why, why are we writing a paper about this? But I sort of had this experience then that I, I knew that this stuff, the stuff that I was learning was really applicable to doing God's work with real flesh and blood people. Because there are questions that I had as I was trying to do that before and didn't have answers to, but then then sort of received at the seminary. And also to sort of living at a high school, again, I, I kind of joke that I went to high school twice because I taught high school for four years after I already graduated high school. So going to high school a second time just opened my eyes to the variety of situations that we live in 
this sort of gray world where we have a lot of black and white answers, especially theologically. There are a lot of things that are just true and right, but the art of applying those answers in a way that communicates, in a way that's really helpful, in a way that isn't aimed at me being right for the sake of being right and being right or being helpful and, and proclaiming what's true for the sake of the people that I'm working with was a really helpful lens and perspective to have coming to the seminary. Yeah, it sounds like all of your experience really is lending itself well to this formation that you're receiving as to, to be a pastor and, and hopefully in, in your future work, wherever that path leads you as in your future as a, as a church worker. Let's talk a little bit more about that formation, the transition of, of moving to seminary. What was that like moving your family from Omaha, was it, to the seminary in St. Louis? Yeah, we. so my wife, Jenny, is the best person in the world. She's awesome. And so I actually tried to get her to talk me out of coming to seminary a bunch of times just because I, I didn't want to like drag her down here. So there are a bunch of times kind of over my my time of teaching that I try to say like, you know, if you say we're not going to do this, then we're not going to do it. But she always say something effective like, well, wherever we need to go to do God's work, that's where we'll go. And so we moved down to St. Louis with a six week old child and a two and a two year old child. So she like really held to it. So we packed up her and she packed up our entire house like as she was like eight nine months pregnant and then had the baby and then we moved down to the seminary and moved into the on-campus apartments here in St. Louis and so the transition was just kind of a whirlwind so I ended teaching in May our baby was born in June and then the sort of the rest of the summer was you know being a new parent for a second time and adding a second kid to our family which was a huge transition itself so it was just sort of this for our family specifically it was just a bunch of transitions sort of right in a row and we both have jenny and i both have very supportive families so we re- received a lot of help for from them in terms of uh, packing and driving vehicles down and stuff like that so it was a, a ton of transitions all sort of right in a row but then transitioning to a student again i guess it was kind of like riding a bike i had you know, done the student thing when I was in college. And then honestly, I worked less when I became a student at the seminary than I did in my first few years of teaching new teachers as, and I'm sure, you know, in your sort of past experiences, church workers, you know, that you just like, you can never do anything well enough, especially the first couple of years. And my response to that was just like work super hard. So actually coming down to the seminary, I was like, oh, I have due dates. I have all this. This is great. So kind of together with all of those different transitions with our family, transitioning as a student, as a student, it was it was a lot of things at the same time, but it was it was really great sort of looking back as I can kind of see how my wife and I grew closer together, how we became sort of a better team and how we raise our kids and then just sort of starting this new time period in our lives just sort of fit right into that specific transition. It was really, really hard to leave Omaha. We both have families in, in Nebraska with a ton of great friends in Omaha. I don't think I would have left the, the, the teaching position where I was for anything except for coming to the seminary. So that was really hard. It's always hard to say goodbye to people that you love, but it is also, it was sort of tempered a little bit knowing where we were going and that we were coming to a place that would be our family for a while and that we were pursuing this call to serve in God's church in this particular capacity. A place that would become your family for a little while. Tell us about that. Tell us about the residential experience and and life at the seminary. Yeah, it's some of the the greatest moments here are are out of the classroom. Like I, I have loved my classes here at Concordia Seminary, but to do things outside of the classroom with the people that you're sort of living with, there's it's a really unique kind of place because everybody everybody is sort of pursuing the same thing. So we're all pursuing basically the same degree, and we all have this sort of future vision for our lives. And all have this. That are that are sort of individual, but also have this collective idea as we're as we're preparing for work in God's church, and so all of the conversations kind of revolve around that, which is which is great. I mean, to a certain extent, you kind of wish like, oh, I I, I could stop talking about class for at least a little while, like let's talk about basketball <laughs> or something like that. But as we have all of these different people around, you sort of have this ready-made group of people who are who have similar life, and you're going through a similar life experience sort of contemporaneously, which is really helpful. You can support each other really, really well. 
I mean, you can you can sort of listen to each other. You can provide help, especially now as like a fourth year student, as as some of my friends who are kind of the first couple of years are talking about classes, I can give advice, some wisdom for how to for to how to think about certain things in classes and stuff like that. But so that's really good. But then also for our family, there have been so many events. We do all kinds of events on our campus that are geared toward fostering community and building relationships outside of the classroom. So things like Prof and Science, where we go get to, to listen to a professor talk about a topic that's I'm kind of funny and encouraging and hear their wisdom. During the summers, we do these cookouts every weekend where, you know, we fed like 200 people last year per weekend. And those are just great opportunities for people to get together to share those experiences. And then you really do grow close together. Um, I know it's it's sort of starting to get real. I'm not taking a call this year because I'm sticking around for an extra degree next year at the seminary, but basically my entire class is. And these are guys who we came into the seminary at the same time and then we experienced a global pandemic together, right? So we've we've done all of this all of this stuff together. We've had all of these experiences together and it's sort of becoming real to me now that these guys are leaving and I'm not going to get to see them face to face, you know, probably not in the same place until like the new creation, which is sort of mind boggling or, you know, maybe a class reunion, those kinds of things. You, you, through these common experiences, you build a bond that's really hard to, to emulate in any sort of different setting. We are talking with Drew Oswald. He's a fourth year student at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis as part of our Set Apart to Serve series here on The Coffee Hour. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are continuing our conversations in the Set Apart to Serve series. Our guest today is Drew Oswald, fourth year student at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, learning about the experience of formation at Concordia Seminary. And Drew, you had some some great examples and painted a great picture for us of what life is like for you and your family at Concordia Seminary here in St. Louis and what that that formation looks like. Now that we've talked about residence, residential life and, and that experience, let's talk about the academics. Yeah, <laughs> that's let's do it. Born the pastor, right? <laughs> What, what was that like, you know, moving into a, a, a whole new academic world as technically a graduate student, a mm-hmm. seminary student? What was that like, especially your first year? Yeah. So getting back into school again, I had just come from being a teacher. So it was like, it was really flipping the script. I was really excited actually to be a student again, where I didn't have to like produce lesson plans. I just sort of got to receive and read <laughs> and ask questions. And that was really, really great. But also to to come into seminary after having taught theology to high school students for four years, having participated in my church and Bible studies and different things like that, it provided this sort of fertile soil of questions that I had. And one of the things that I was most encouraged about our seminary sort of right off the bat is that a lot of the questions that I was asking, a lot of the things that I had really struggled with, there was a clear spot in our curriculum that we were going to deal with that. And so that was really exciting just from a kind of a scope and sequence kind of angle. That was really, really good. It was different to sort of hop in again and think about like writing papers that I would have to turn into somebody else when they would have to give a grade to. So I had to kind of remember how I was going to do that. I actually have this, I, I had this experience sort of first year where I like didn't have time to proofread a paper and just I I, like sort of getting it back and going like, oh man, if I just would have read through this a couple of times. So sort of adjusting schedules, those kinds of things to get back into the swing of things. And also reading a lot. I hadn't read as much as you do at the seminary sort of ever before, even in undergrad, because I was an undergrad student, an undergrad student who are sort of by definition 
not good students, but sort of coming in again, then with life experience, knowing what it takes to be a good student, knowing what it takes to sort of get out of education, what I need to get out of it. And knowing then from a teacher's perspective that a lot of that is what you put into it. I'm sort of shaped how I viewed coming into the seminary again. What was some of the, the coursework that you took the first two years, of course, with the residential, like the typical residential formation route? You know, you have your first two years of classes and then a vicarage and then you're, you're in your fourth year now. In those first two years before your vicarage, where were some of those courses that, that you had to take? Yeah, so you got sort of the regular introduction classes. So they're four departments. We got so all of the introductory classes to those departments. So introduction to historical theology, introduction to practical theology, systematic theology, and exegetical theology. So doing all of those sorts of things. And then creeds and confessions and the systematics department, other some other sort of pre- I don't remember all the names to these, so I, I apologize <laughs> for that. So things like creeds and confessions and then some more practical kind of things. And then you start for in our curriculum, you start learning how to preach the second semester of your first year. So starting that, that sort of prac, those guys, and then second year, a couple of exegetical classes where you look at like prophets and then the Torah and then, oh boy, I'm trying, sorry, I'm trying to remember all those, all the names. I promise I remember the material, I even if I don't remember, if, I know, I know I would have printed off my transcript or something if I knew how to find it. So if, and then <laughs> systematics classes, and I'm a, I'm a kind of a systematics guy at heart. So those are the ones I remember really, really well. I love all of the other departments as brothers in Christ of a systematics is kind of really where my heart is. So things like church and world systematics one. And then I actually got the opportunity to take some classes during the summer too. And then during the, during winter, um, which is really great, sort of help loosen up my schedule a little bit, especially for this year, but also to pick up some things that I, I don't know if I ever would have ever would have had the opportunity to learn just sort of in the regular scope of things and then sort of opening interest to to future study. A couple of other classes, the theology of ethics and human care as a second year was a really, really helpful class, like a really helpful class. And then I took Lutheran pastoral theologian during the summer, and that was just incredible. So to have those sorts of different opportunities has been really great. <laughs> So after those first two years of classes, hitting the books hard for two years again, <laughs> then into third year, which is a bit more immersive than mm. anything you've probably experienced before, correct? Right. Yes. It's, it's, it's a completely different, it's a completely different kind of education. I learned a ton. I'm so sort of starting vicarage was, was very different. Thankfully for our family, we didn't have to move. We actually had our third baby. We had our third baby. My wife had our third baby in October of our vicarage year while we were at Village with Sarah and friends. And so we didn't have to move, which was really, really great. But then to see how a church worked, I'd been at a Lutheran school, so I kind of know how Lutheran institutions work on one level, but being at a church is, is very different. I've always sort of been around people and sort of have to have these times where I'm sort of in my office and there's like nobody else around. That was different. But then also too at Village, we had a really interesting experience because we were on a pastoral vacancy when I did my vicarage, or at least the first nine months of my vicarage. So that was a fascinating experience to learn also. And so I've had all of these different opportunities, whether it's in the classroom or on vicarage, to learn things that I didn't even, a lot of them I knew that I needed to learn, but some of them I didn't either. I've been really appreciative of all those. What were some of those things that you learned on your vicarage that that you know are going to be serving you when you eventually have a call in a, in a parish, Lord willing, when that time comes for you? What are some of those things that, that really are going to stick with you from your vicarage experience? Well, I think the biggest thing is to be able to live with a specific group of people and to, to, to teach and to preach to a, to, to them right, to to bear God's word to them. So I, it's like when I go then to the scriptures to prepare a sermon, after I've you know, been at Village for, for six or eight or nine months, I could go to the scriptures with with the people of Village in my mind to, to think about how do they need to hear God's word and what is God saying for them rather than just sort of imagined congregation, if that makes some sense. So I didn't have to, like, I didn't have to sort of ab- think of this abstract, group of people, but I could think of people who who had real stories, who had real hurts, 
but real joys, but real sins, but real strengths. And sort of think of, to really think about being God's person on the ground in a specific place to share his word with those people, just to keep that sort of first in my mind, first and foremost. And then there are other things too, obviously, various kind of leadership things, formation things. And when you're only at a place for a year, you don't, you, there's a, a lot of observing. So there's some ideas that I would like to try that I'll get to try out at a congregation someday for better or for worse, I guess we'll see. But to just, especially to, to hear the stories of people and to, to then approach God's word with their stories in mind and then get to go back to them to share God's word with, with them specifically is a huge lesson. Now, having had that immersive experience on Vicarage, coming back to classes for fourth year, how does that impact your perspective or how does that maybe change your perspective on the classes that you're taking sitting back in the classroom mm -hmm. again? Yeah, so it's it's kind of an intensification of some of the teacher experience that I brought in that when I go back to read now or to sit in class, I have, uh, again, these real concrete experiences that it's not this sort of esoteric or ephemeral kind of stuff it's it's really it's it's really grounded in serving God's people with his word it bringing them to life through the gospel and shaping them with his law and to think about that again not in an abstract way because it's it's easy to get this impression when you go through seminary or, or any really theological training that like oh if I just sort of like color by number right the way I heard about it in the classroom then this is all going to like work out whatever that end goal might be but it turns out that people are really really complicated and that they have they they bring with them stories and experiences and, and opinions and a lot of those are really good and a huge blessing but there's still always a give and take that happens in communication whether it's between vicar and congregation teacher and student so to sort of be able to listen really, really well to what people are are saying, to what they're expressing about how they think, about how they how they feel about things, but about how they're receiving. Because there are definitely times over Vicarage where, where people would say things like, "Oh, I really appreciate it in your in your sermon how you how you said this," something like that. And then in my mind, I would go some of the effect of like, "Wow, I need to get better at saying what I what I'm trying to preach so that they actually hear." Because it's probably not a problem with them, right? It's it's it, it's it's if there's something I can do to help sort of get out of the way so God can work with his people that that I'd like to try to do that and have that experience over Vicarage is and then coming into the classroom with that in mind has been helpful. So now that you're you're nearing the tail end of this experience, uh, doing another year for for your STM, right? What is your what is your advice, encouragement for young people that are maybe considering, or or not so young people, maybe second career folks who are considering attending the seminary, pursuing this path of church work? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, I keep considering it. It's a keep considering it. Don't don't sort of don't give up. So that's sort of number one. But then two, I would just say. Talk to as many people as you know, you know, talk to your pastor, talk to people in your life. If you're married, talk to your wife, talk to your siblings or friends. Think of the most honest person you know in your life and you ask questions about like, hey, could you see me doing this? Do you think that this might be a good idea? Um, and sort of do that. And then also visit when I was, when I was in college, actually I visited, I visited both seminaries, talked with a lot of different folks. Just to get feedback, we believe that God works through means. He works through people that he places in your life. He works through your neighbors. He works through the people that you love. And they can provide clarity. Yeah, because there are all sorts of things you have to take into consideration, especially if you're a second career person. Coming to the seminary to be a, a pastor or a deaconess, there are lots of considerations. Like we, my wife and I sort of just started having kids when we came down here. There, there I said it again. My wife just started having our children when we came down here. So there are all these sort of family considerations for us to to take into account. And those are really important things. So visit, talk to the, the admissions people we have here in St. Louis are absolutely great. So talk to them. Um, talk to as many people as possible and then continue, continue to rub God's ears with with, with your requests for for clarity for for his blessing on your decision making process for his clarity on, on timing or whether to to come here or not because there are, there are all sorts of things that 
that go on as you sort of make this decision and without the Holy Spirit guiding you, whether it's through the people he's placed you in place in your life or through its, your own deliberations, you shouldn't do it alone. And and God has promised he's going to hear you. He promised he's going to He's going to guide you and he's promised to take care of, of his church. So whether that includes you as a layman or whether that includes you as an ordained minister or as a commissioned deaconess, God has, God has promised that. So he's going to, he's going to take care of his church. I mean, he's going to take care of you as well as you try to discern what your future might hold. Our guest today, Drew Oswald, fourth year student at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. Drew, thanks so much for being our guest on The Coffee Hour. You're welcome. Thank you again for, for having me on. This has been great. You can learn more about Set Apart to Serve by visiting lcms.org slash SAS. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit kfuo.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at kfuo.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.